comments? Great, wonderful. Welcome, good morning. It is Thursday, February 11th, and this is a joint hearing of House Judiciary and House Government Operation Committees. And we are here to hear the 2020 report on model statewide policy for law enforcement use of force. Uh, and with us today, we have um, the commissioner of uh, DPS, Department of Public Safety, and the executive director of policy development for the Department of Public Safety. So I welcome you both. Good morning, thank you. Good morning, uh, thanks for having us. Um, uh, it's uh, for the record, it's uh, Mike Sherling, uh, Commissioner of Public Safety. Apologies, I'm pivoting from one train of thought to a completely separate train of thought. So it might take me a minute to get uh, with the program. Um, appreciate being before uh, both committees simultaneously on this. Um, I think our plan is to just uh, spend probably less than 10 minutes uh, walking through some background because you do have the report uh, in front of uh, you and then we can answer uh, any questions or go in whatever direction uh, the committee would like on uh, additional information. Uh, for background and context, um, I probably sound a little bit like a broken record at this point, but uh, for any new committee members, um, the, the context for much of the work that is going on uh, includes a modernization strategy that we put forth last uh, January when this session uh, kicked off that in part um, was informed by uh, a number of decades of uh, reports. And uh, we, at that point, had begun talking about uh, accelerating the pace of change uh, relative to uh, training, information technology, um, statewide policy uh, development and implementation um, while balancing the needs of local control for certain components of public safety operations, both in law enforcement and, and other areas, um, but balancing that against the need for uh, standardization in key uh, areas. Um, additional background and uh, context, uh, you'll recall that um, I think last year, uh, on a number of occasions, we testified about the extent to which force is used specifically within the, the state police, that the state police respond to somewhere between 120 and 125,000 events per year. That conservatively uh, creates about a quarter of a million contacts with the public. Uh, and on an annual basis, the last three years, there have been uh, approximately 200 instances in which force beyond compliant handcuffing um, was used. Uh, additional contextual information, um, also uh, in part related to some of the things we were talking about with modernization, that uh, policy, um, which we're going to talk about in greater depth in just a moment, uh, goes together with a variety of other key things, hiring, uh, training, the development of policy, supervision, and um, then ultimately uh, accountability and on not only for uh, individual officers and for organizational uh, operations, but um, that accountability also takes the form of uh, constant um, evolution of uh, policies and procedures and uh, debriefing events as they happen, whether they're critical events or non-critical events and a, a constant state of evolution that occurs uh, throughout the public safety footprint, and in particular uh, in, in law enforcement and the fire service. Also important to note that multiple policies and training and all the other things that I mentioned actually weave together to form the basis for complex operations. Um, there's no one policy across the dozens uh, that exist, uh, I'm speaking particularly about the, the state police, that um, can be taken alone to guide any particular response uh, or event. And uh, just a couple of additional contextual notes. Um, there uh, has been um, renewed emphasis on uh, de-escalation and uh, we'll talk more about that relative to the policy itself, but um, I just wanna flag that that is something that has been in play um, throughout my career, which spans back uh, 30 
years now, um, de-escalation has been a key component of training policy development and the operational landscape, despite some of the narratives that have um, sort of driven our uh, acceleration of these uh, strategies in recent months. And also want to flag that our alternative response models, which have been in play in Vermont for more than two decades, in particular, the use of mental health clinicians or social workers in tandem with criminal justice response to really weave together a criminal justice and public health construct uh, are something that uh, we've accelerated with funding from uh, this body over the last year. We now have funding to deploy um, nine, uh, excuse me, eight um, mental health clinicians to uh, barracks around the state, um, bringing that total up from two and uh, having those operations exist in tandem with similar operations around the state. So all of that forms the, the background context um, within which uh, ultimately S-119 was passed last year, which is where we're gonna pivot now, and then the policy development um, that occurred in tandem um, with that. So uh, last year, General Assembly passed S-119, which became Act 165. And while we had differences of opinion relative to the mechanisms to achieve a, uh, a, an updated statewide use of force standard uh, and how to get everyone on the same page, um, we embraced the general tenets uh, contained within that bill and ultimately the act and as soon as it was passed and signed into law, uh, I believe first of uh, first week of October, I think it became law. We began uh, initial drafting work and engagement processes, which we'll outline in greater depth in a moment. Because of the scope of work um, set against the pandemic and all of the other things that are happening, uh, we felt it necessary to to add some capacity. Uh, so, uh, the goodness of her heart, Jen Morrison came. Uh, back into the fold, having extensive uh, experience uh, in law enforcement and public safety in Vermont, and very much a uh, a, a change agent and a uh, a community engagement specialist from her time as a uh, an area lieutenant in uh, the health section of Burlington, dealing with uh, town gown relations and um, and engaging neighborhoods there through uh, her time as deputy chief and uh, and chief of police in in Colchester. Um, she was nice enough to, to come in and help us run a very robust engagement process and drafting process. And I should also note, uh, in terms of her background, um, she was the very first uh, national accreditation manager for a law enforcement agency in Vermont, dating back to the mid-90s in Burlington, uh, when Burlington became the first agency in Vermont to be nationally accredited. Uh, so on that note, um, mm -hmm. I will uh, pause. Commissioner, I, I do I do see a hand. Um, go ahead, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, we in government operations heard testimony that there is currently no mandated de-escalation training for police. I'm curious if you can tell us more about what this initiative looks like for building out de-escalation. I'd be happy to take um, that one. Yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll let uh, Jen talk about the next steps. And uh, in terms of what is in place now, I would probably want to bring in both the uh, folks from the uh, Vermont Police Academy and the Criminal Justice Training Council and the State Police Training Division to give you uh, an overview of the last decade uh, of evolution in that, uh, in that arena. I could speak historically to our efforts in Burlington, but they'd be a little dated as I've been out of that for about uh, six years. And I will flag as I turn it over to Jen that um, I don't believe there is a mandate for de-escalation training, but I would also flag that there are more than 90 uh, policies within the Vermont State Police, roughly the same number uh, in Burlington um, based on my experience. And the number of training topics is uh, enormous and the number of mandated training topics I can count on one hand. So uh, mandating training and, and policy is not um, typically needed to push uh, the evolution of these things uh, forward. Not, not that it's, uh, it is sometimes a good idea, it's just it doesn't drive the vast majority uh, of the work that's in progress on any given day. So with that, I will stop talking and hand it to Jen. Uh, thank you, Commissioner, and thank you for the question. Um, the level of 
uh, de-escalation training that is currently offered at the Vermont Police Academy, I would not want to speak to because I know things have been uh, different in the last year and a half. But I can tell you that going forward uh, as part of this process around the use of force policy, um, we have already begun envisioning a rollout of statewide de-escalation training. And it's not decided which, uh, which type, I, I, don't know, I don't know if it's called a vendor or whatever, but in Burlington, they've been using the Police Executive Research Forum's ICAT training for numerous years, and they have had significant success with that model. And it is one of the only evidence-based models. So for the sake of this discussion, um, we are in the process of gathering up uh, the cost of putting on not just train the trainer sessions, but also uh, attendee sessions to within the next year, try and reach every sworn law enforcement officer with a 12 hour de-escalation, very, very um, holistic uh, training model. So we are trying to get those numbers and that vision uh, together in anticipation of federal funding becoming available through uh, um, the, uh, I think it's BJA funding, but it's certainly coming from the Department of Justice. And we anticipate seeing those grant announcements in the next six to eight weeks. So we, are, we want to be ready with a proposal to fund de-escalation training statewide. Um, I'm glad you mentioned that at the front end because I want you to know as you look through this use of force policy draft that we have, we, we believe that we hear where you want us to go. We are trying to go far above and beyond what is contained in S-119. Uh, and we can speak to some of that in the next, uh, when we get into the, the meat of the policy, so to speak. But I right. hope that answered your question. Yeah, thank you. As a quick follow-up, how are you defining success for a de-escalation training? That's a, that's a great question. Actually, really let me interject here and actually bring you back to the mid 1990s. And I'm going to give you the example of one of the first uh, iterations of this that I was involved in. Uh, in the mid 90s, uh, we were training and, and I was one of uh, the members of a crisis negotiation team that was created uh, involving uh, folks throughout Chittenden County, other places in Vermont and the state police trained by FBI crisis negotiators to de-escalate uh, serious situations like uh, uh, hostage taking, barricaded subjects with weapons, things of that nature. And then and the methodology that flowed from that was to train first all the first responders in how to initially go to crises, whether they were at that level or that they were a lower level um, of uh, folks presenting threats, uh, acting out with um, unusual behavior, et cetera. Uh, and taking a cross section of that, uh, the high end rubrics uh, and best operating practice and apply that in first response. And we were doing that back in uh, 1994, 1995. And it has evolved substantially uh, since then to, to uh, include more training from uh, crisis clinicians. Um, I recall in the early 2000s, bringing in uh, the clinical directors uh, from the Howard Center to do uh, de-escalation training in Chittenden County, a multi-agency training that we hosted at, at Burlington PD, and those things were happening on, on an annual basis. So, uh, the, But my earliest recollection of that was what I just described back in, in 1995. In terms of, it's a great question in terms of uh, how you measure success. The measure of success is actually the thing that you don't see on the front page of newspapers. When things go poorly uh, in law enforcement interactions, they're front page news. Um, when there's a use of force where a taser is deployed, where um, I have to be really careful not to jinx us and knock on wood and say when a firearm is discharged, uh, those things happen a handful of times in any given year. At the same time, there are literally thousands of events that are successfully de-escalated on a day-to-day -day basis. And uh, those do not make front page news because they're not really click worthy. Um, we measure those in a variety of ways, but frankly, in, uh, in state government, um, we have had systems that have been a bit antiquated and unable to tell us with great granularity what cross section of our events uh, involve some kind of crisis that, that uh, needs de-escalation. We are pivoting now to a statewide computer aided dispatch and records management system signed a contract just a few weeks ago to deploy uh, by July 1 uh, within the state police and then to deploy to the remainder of Vermont agencies uh, over the, the months that follow. Uh, that will give us the ability to measure with far more granularity 
what types of things are being de-escalated, what are the root causes of various kinds of responses. Um, historically, we've been very good at being able to tell you what kinds of things contribute to crimes that occur, but crimes are about 15, in some cases, as low as 10% of the responses by police departments to events statewide. So uh, being able to measure with granularity what's driving neighbor disputes or um, some other cross-section of things that are not, uh, don't rise to the level of crime, but are impacting communities uh, in other ways uh, has been a point of, uh, of weakness that we are remedying right now. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Um, uh, so committees, we have, uh, it's 920 right now. We only have another 40 minutes or so. So I'm gonna call on John Gannon and then I'm gonna hope that we can shift our focus to the report and uh, maybe ask clarifying questions about the presentation that, um, that, that we have before us. And then uh, we can ask broader questions if we have time afterwards. So John Gannon, go ahead. Thanks, I think this is a pretty quick question. Um, Jen, you mentioned that I believe it's the ICAP training for de-escalation. Um, and you know, could you just tell us when that training will go live? Um, I don't have that level of detail yet, sir. It's, um, I've been in contact with the Police Executive Research Forum to get a, uh, like a package envisioned of how we would reach all the officers in within that one year period of time, including training up a cadre of our own trainers. So not just hosting training that we attend, but then creating our own trainers as well. I have not gotten details back from them on it. And, and in, this has to be undertaken in conjunction with the Vermont Police Academy. And as you know, they're in a little bit of flux right now and they are onboarding a brand new council. So this has been something that's staying in my wheelhouse right now, but as soon as we're able to get some bandwidth on the academy side, we're gonna be doing this jointly. My, my goal would be to get the trainings uh, rolling before Labor Day, but not much before Labor Day, because those are sometimes staffing shortage times, uh, before Labor Day and going into next spring. So over about a seven month window between this coming fall and next spring would be the goal. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, Madam Chair, Would uh, we had a couple more things planned to say. Would Shall we finish up with our planned report? Yes, please. Please, okay. thank you. Yeah. So the commissioner was explaining and the report very clearly walks through how we, the process that, that we took to um, create the draft that you see. And I wanted to uh, share with the group the, the goals of policy. I mean, policy development in and of itself is a, is a very discreet and thin slice area of law enforcement. And it's part of a much broader context within which we operate. But in this case, uh, to create a best practice use of force policy, I have been keeping the following goals in mind. Um, one, that it meets the statutory, statutory mandate while two, providing clear direction to the officers in the field who have to be able to operationalize this policy, and three, to be able to build a policy that lends itself to clear, realistic training curriculum. Having a policy is no good unless we can train to it and unless we can convey it to the officers in the field who have to be able to understand it and make it work in the field. And I would also say that this is a this is a pretty big um, lift to try and create a policy that can be operationalized by a game warden on their own out you know, dozens of miles from backup and it works equally well uh, in an urban area, shall we say. So those are the main goals of, of the policy development. And we have focused hard on emphasizing getting to yes so that when we hear feedback and as you'll see, we've had quite a bit of feedback um, we're, we want to get to yes in as many places as we can when we receive feedback. And we are very appreciative of the collaboration that we've had so far with the bill sponsors, the S-119 bill sponsors and others who have provided valuable feedback. Um, I want to point out that we've done significant work to get consensus statewide on the post lethal force incident investigation procedure. And it shows up as an appendix in, in what in the policy. I point this out to you because it is incredibly important to know how much um, 
collaboration and talking and meeting and uh, work went into getting the Chiefs Association, the Sheriff's Association, the VPA, all the large membership groups of law enforcement and collective bargaining units as well to agree that we are all going to have from this point forward a uniform policy of what happens when an officer takes an action that results in serious bodily injury or death to a, to a citizen. This is something that has never existed before and I call your attention to it because it it is demonstrative of how we are trying to go beyond what the mandate is that you laid out for us in S-119. We want to do these things consistently from the north, south, east, west parts of the state. Um, and there were some pretty hot conversations that happened with law enforcement groups across the state, uh, but this is the first time that there will be a statewide policy that provides consistency anytime one of these incidents occurred. Um, furthermore, you'll also note in the draft policy that there is a placeholder for an appendix, which will be built in collaboration with stakeholders to provide statewide guidance to officers on interacting with persons experiencing or perceived to be experiencing mental impairment. So we hope that these efforts will uh, show you the seriousness with which we have approached this task and the de degree of commitment on behalf of the entire Vermont law enforcement community to not only meet, but to exceed the expectations of our communities as we take on these most important projects and policies. Um, it, it's a lot of work, as you can imagine, getting everyone to, and they won't all agree, but to getting to a place where a statewide policy can be embraced. Um, so that is how we've gotten there. We have drafted a policy that was posted in December. Um, we have sought feedback. We have received feedback. You have a spreadsheet that details that feedback. There is a small working group. Uh, uh, DPS and the Vermont League of Cities and Towns has a small five person working group. And we have already met once to go through the feedback that we have received. We've gotten through about one third of that feedback. We have a second meeting this afternoon after lunch to go through another third, we hope, of the feedback. Uh, and we hope that the following week we will get through the rest of the feedback that we have received. Um, following that, you can expect to see an updated draft, uh, which it's a little chicken or egg at this point. I, I, until we know what happens with H145, we can't really say this is our final draft policy because we don't know what the the statute's going to say, but you can anticipate uh, an updated policy as soon as we have a clear indication of, of where, we're, where things are headed. Uh, Commissioner, did you want to talk about uh, improvement or would you like me to talk about things that we believe could be further improvements to H145 or would you like us to wait on that? How would you like to proceed? I would leave that to the at the chair's discretion if you'd like us to discuss that now or wait. I know there's another uh, hearing immediately following this on that topic specifically. And we also are prepared to address some of the questions that uh, the, the House Judiciary Committee um, asked at last week's hearing. Um, I took notes of what, what questions were asked, so we can proceed as you wish. Okay, uh, before I respond, I see that uh, Representative Burdett has his hand up and then also Representative Coburn, so that that might. Um, as far as uh, Jen's question goes, I would love to hear that because I had uh, that question, basically the same um, question written down. So I, I would love to hear that. Great. He yeah. would love. Uh, sorry. Tom, can you could you restate your or maybe a oh yeah no I, I well what I had written down and it, I'm pretty sure it pertains to what she said is uh, I had if you could fix the use of force what would you change and why? Thank you. Um, well, <laughs> we we think that H145 represents a significant improvement over some areas of S119. Uh, there are three things that we hope could. Uh, be added. The first is, I think, a housekeeping item, the uh, implementation dates. We were, we were looking for a little more clarity and consistency to allow for room to develop policy and deploy training. So it was unclear in reading the draft that we saw 
some of the implementation dates appear to be July 1st and some September 1st. So we would ask that September 1st at the earliest be a consistent implementation date. Um, start with the easy asks, right? <laughs> Uh, we also would like to, we appreciate that uh, the prohibited restraint definition has been made more clear, but the policy or the, I'm sorry, the legislation continues to be missing language that acknowledges the, that the use of uh, a prohibited restraint would be permissible when lethal force is justified. Um, I, I know that some members of the committee have pointed to the justifiable homicide statute as being sort of the answer to this we would ask um, that we, we don't believe that it, that it is sufficient. For example, if an officer is in a struggle where lethal force is justified and instead of using a firearm, the officer uses a prohibited restraint and the incident is resolved without serious bodily injury or death, i.e. the prohibited restraint resulted in a less harmful outcome, the officer would not be protected by the justifiable homicide statute and would theoretically be facing a 20 year felony and loss of certification, et cetera. Um, we would ask that specific language be incorporated into the statute because that forms the backbone of this statewide policy that the use of a per prohibited restraint is permissible when le lethal force is justified. And the third request that we would have, section B5 continues to be a very um, challenging section of legislation to operationalize and to build training around. Um, most use of force scenarios are very fast moving, time limited events. There may be no time to assess the underlying cause of a subject's behavior. The way section B5 is written appears to be referring to the slow rolling situations, and I know that your committees last year talked about some of those that have happened around the state. So it's important to note that we support the spirit of this section, but as written, it is still rigid and does not acknowledge that there are instances when time and information do not allow this level of analysis. So we would ask that the following language be added at the beginning of section B5. It is four words. We would ask, that, this, that section B5 starts to the extent feasible, comma, when a law enforcement officer knows and leave the rest of it as it is. This is merely to acknowledge the fact that most of these situations happen very, very quickly. And these slow rolling, long drawn out events are, are not the norm in use of force scenarios. Um, and, and I would also point out that even when we know that there can be an underlying, that there may be an underlying impairment with a person. It does, we can't always modify the response, even knowing that somebody is impaired, whether that's um, experiencing a mental impairment or substance impaired, um, it doesn't always mean we can modify the response. So that, those would be the three asks, the implementation dates, inclusion of prohibited restraint being permissible in lethal force situations and appending uh, to the extent feasible at the beginning of section B5. Great, thank you. Uh, let's see, uh, Selena and then Martin. Sorry, I was trying to be so good lowering my hand, but someone had already done it for me. Um, so I just really want to say I, I, how much I do appreciate the hard and quick work that the Department of Public Safety has undertaken over the last several months to bring ideas and policies forward. Um, and my question is um, specifically about the forthcoming Appendix D and just wanting to hear a little bit more about your process there. It sounds like you're working with quite a lot of feedback that's come in, which is great. I'm wondering um, if there's more direct work that you all are doing as you craft that particular penance with key stakeholders. And, um, and also if part of what you're looking at there is 
the question of when a police response is the right response at all in those situations and what some of the off ramps might look like when it's not. Yes, th thank you. That's um, the, the short answer to your question is the work has not begun yet on Appendix D. Um, it is probably going to be a more difficult policy to create given um, the complexities and, and really a rapidly evolving best practices in this field. I can tell you that in Burlington, we've been using teams, mental health clinicians out in the field with law enforcement officers for 15 years at least. So it's not a new concept to myself or the commissioner. Um, I envision for process engaging with uh, Disability Rights Vermont, Mad Freedom, the Howard Center, uh, our own Department of Mental Health, of course, through, through the state, and candidly, any other stakeholder who wants to be part of the process. And I would envision it, the process being similar where we, we publicize and ask for input at the front end before I, we even put pen to paper, receive what people want us to consider for guiding principles or, or best practices or model policies from somewhere else and then start drafting and pushing it out and receiving feedback. So it, it will be an iterative process, um, but really we need to hear from the people who are the professionals in this field um, about that. And yes, I anticipate that there will be some recommendations on types of situations, uh, understanding that some communities won't have any resource to fall back on in terms of mental health professionals. And again, we have to send out guidelines that will work statewide. Um, there will be recommendations on situations that perhaps law enforcement shouldn't be the first in, the first one called. Um, so it's a work in progress and I don't even, I can't even begin to give you a date on how quickly we could move on that, but it is high on the to-do list as soon as we get another draft of the use of force up and as soon as we get the body-worn camera policy tucked away and a couple other things that are out there. Thank you, and I would just um, add uh that i encourage it sounds like you will be doing lots of work to identify who those key stakeholders are but i encourage you to ask to add nami vermont to your starting list we heard from them um earlier this session and they have a lot of lived experience around this issue and a and a pretty clear point of view they're advocating for and they seem like a, a key key group to get in the mix early yes, uh, yes ma'am they I'm actually quite good friends with their um, one of their spokespersons, and uh, I would absolutely include them. They they have they were pretty close allies when I was the chief in Colchester, so they will be on the list. Good. And if I may, Madam Chair, I just want to add a couple of historic comments here. Um, working back to front, um, relative to NAMI, I agree. Uh, a great organization that brings a lot to the table. I actually co-chaired their fundraising walk for, I believe, three years uh, in a row when I was chief in Burlington. Um, but I, do, I, I don't say this to cast dispersions, but I really want these committees to understand the context within which we're continuing to do this work. When I became chief in Burlington in 2008, I began literally begging the state of Vermont to build this capacity so much so that I had secretaries of human services coming to meetings uh, on a monthly basis with service providers in our community room in Burlington, where we collectively were begging for additional resources to respond to things in lieu of sending law enforcement, in lieu of people having to go take up weeks in our emergency departments waiting for uh, services. And, um, you know, quite frankly, uh, the, those who preceded you and those who preceded me distanced themselves from their core obligations to deliver these services. We are now trying to remedy that. And um, most of the blame, if you will, is a landing on law enforcement when these are systemic failures unrelated to law enforcement that date back decades. So I wanna take this opportunity just to call out uh, the extent to which law enforcement is being vilified and, and eviscerated for not responding to these things um, with the deft that a physician could is not the fault of law enforcement leaders. I hear you, Commissioner, and you know, was heard your advocacy often and loudly 
in, in Burlington and appreciate it. And I think you're absolutely right that the state needs to be funding and building out a um, mental health response. Thank you. Uh, Martin. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, uh, Jen, for the uh, testimony. I, d I had um, a couple of questions, uh, just follow up on, on your uh, suggestions. Um, I think probably the first one is fairly straightforward to deal with, the implementation dates. Uh, the second one, as far as prohibited restraint, I'd certainly like to hear what your, if you have any recommended language uh, uh, for that. Uh, I know that we did uh, have several different uh, attempts to try to get there last uh, summer, and, and there was various language that was proposed, and I could look back at that, but would certainly be helpful if, if you have uh, any suggestions on that. The, the third item, the, as far as with respect to B5, uh, the to the extent feasible, I mean, I, that seems to me, and I'd like you to comment on this, to be somewhat, you know, goes without saying, or, or it's kind of surplus, surplusage as far as the language, because uh, elsewhere, I mean, you can't read B5 by itself, uh, you have to look at, uh, one has to look at the definition of totality of circumstances. Uh, one should look at B4, which talks about uh, the uh, use of force having to be objectively reasonable, but evaluated from the perspective of the reasonable officer in the same situation based on the totality of circumstances in, in new language, which we still need to discuss. And I would like you to weigh in on whether you do that now or in the next part of our, um, our uh, session this morning, the, without the benefit of hindsight. Uh, but it just seems, it seems that that's not necessary. But uh, then on the other hand, I'm, I'm not terribly bothered by it because I think it's, it's just restating what other sections say. If you could just comment on, on, on that. So want... go ahead, Commissioner. I was going to say I'm happy to take the first crack at that. Um, well, it may eventually be interpreted, th those sections may be interpreted together. It is not unusual for a section to be interpreted by itself. And the most important piece here is that we've got to train 1,200 people that are not lawyers, that do not sit in committee and uh, try to digest the political ramifications of uh, a policy that there are a uh, yeah a policy that is set in statute. They have to be able to operationalize it on the fly, and to the extent to which we can have each section be clear unto itself, that vastly helps the implementation and training that goes with something this complicated. I think if if I could just add to the commissioner's comment and, and please understand that being able to make a policy that can be operationalized and trained to is the primary objective. Um, it also is in, in our estimation, somewhat of a recognition that there is not always time to do this laundry list of, of, of assessment in B5. And again, that, 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 that is, it is a recognition that when you're able to, you need, and an officer knows you need to take that into consideration about what force you use, if any. Appending it at the beginning is a recognition that there is not always that, that luxury of, of understanding what is driving behaviors. We train police officers to address behaviors, dangerous behaviors. Dangerous behaviors are frequently uh, addressed either with a use of force or other technique. We have a lot of mechanisms on the back end of an encounter with, a, with a, another person for uh, identifying the root cause of what drove their behavior. We have a mental health court, we have uh, the, the drug court, we have regular court, we have reparative processes for lower level offenses. We have all sorts of avenues on the back, the back doors of an encounter to identify the root cause of, of what drove a behavior. We don't have the luxury all the time out on the road of understanding what is driving someone's behavior very frequently we roll up, the behavior is already happening, it's underway, 
and we have to resolve a situation. Or it goes from a benign encounter to a very escalated encounter very quickly. I think appending those four words at the beginning is an acknowledgement that it's not always possible to assess the root cause of behaviors as you're on the scene. So, so a follow-up question, if I may. Um, so how, how does that, well, let me back up. So, so I see the, and I think that, that this is something you've been doing very well. It, I mean, I see the, the standards we're setting forth in the statute working hand in hand with the policy. You know, that, that's the idea that, that, that this alone does not get to where we want, you know, the statutory standards alone don't get to where we want to be. So I, I definitely want to see these working together. But I guess the question is, uh, how, how does adding those words even really impact what you would be putting in the policy? Uh, I guess I'm not understanding, you know, it, it would be nice to understand what the policy says uh, on this particular component, which we don't have in here yet. Uh, relative to what we have have in B five, you know, we don't have Appendix D, you know, uh, in in the policy. No, it, but you do it, have language from B five in the draft policy. Right, right. I've seen that, but but it's 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 the actual, as you say, the operationalizing language. And I'm just kind of curious how just having to the extent feasible necessarily changes what you would be putting in in the Appendix D and in, in kind of adding flesh to this whole. Uh, concept. The, the, the way it changes is that both the policy and the training will train folks in exactly the way Jen just described it, that when you roll up on this thing, if it is feasible to do something else and to slow things down, do it. If it is not, you, um, there is no, it, you, you have the option um, of, uh, of acting um, within the bounds of the rest of the, the statute, the policy, and your training to act. Uh, our fear is that as written, this is going to paralyze action because there, it is almost impossible to operationalize in fast moving situations. That's why this language is needed. And uh, I will reiterate a request I made um, early last summer for, for anyone who has not spent at least one shift in a police car responding to these events and seeing how they unfold. I cannot stress enough how important that is. So just one, one again, uh, I don't mean to belabor this, but it seems to me that the policy that you could be writing right now on dealing with those situations could be precisely what you're talking about with or without this additional four words. But, you know, so, so, I don't think that I think that this language B five, particularly when you look at the the rest of the of the statute, is plenty flexible for uh, for you to put that into a, a effect with the policy. But having said that, you know, I I, I did want to hear what what your rationale for it. It doesn't seem to me at initial blush to be a big deal putting those four words in. But we have to hear from uh, obviously other people. That's why I'm pushing you on that. Uh, I'm not saying I disagree with this language one way or another, but I'm just kind of pushing to make sure I understand. Um, I do have just one real quick, I, I'm wondering if, if we're gonna be talking uh, with, uh, with Jen later, or if I should ask the questions I have about that other provision as far as without the benefit of hindsight, or if, if we're gonna have additional testimony later and I can save it for then. Um, I think actually we are gonna have additional testimony, but I think it's good for government operations to, um, to hear these questions and responses as well. Um, should, should so I go, wait? go ahead. Uh, okay. Should I wait for Representative Anthony to ask his question and then he can come back to me? Sure. <laughs> go ahead. Myself? Yes. <laughs> okay, thank you. <clears throat> I want to go back to Representative Colburn's um, discussion about stakeholders around a table and um, also tie that to Ms. Morrison's uh, urging to, to try to focus on the reality at the front end as she uh, describes it uh, in a uh, response, an interaction between a PD and um, a, uh, a call. Uh, I think very quickly, 
uh, to, again, get to the practicality of operationalizing, as you've spoken, you very quickly, if this is a response to a call, becomes, evolves into a team response. That is to say, a law enforcement officer and someone else alternately trained, whether it's social work, mental health, whatever. I think very quickly, uh, some guidance would be had from examining some kind of model memorandum of understanding between the PD and, for instance, uh, the uh, uh, regional mental health, uh, whether it's uh, Howard or Washington County, uh, because again, operationally, as you've explained, things unfold very fast. I want to be real clear as to who's responsible for what kind of scenario when you arrive on the scene. I happen to um, Barry and Montpelier have already engaged with Washington County Mental Health. We have a model, I think, a model memorandum of understanding, thanks to Mary Moulton. Happy to uh, have her submit that. Uh, I also uh, have a bill in H45 to go to all the municipal departments and offer that team approach uh, when it's appropriate. But again, unless there's an understanding as to who's responsible for what and who's in charge, given certain facts, uh, operationalizing any kind of team approach with non-law uh, enforcement people uh, will be uh, do doomed or at least inefficient. So I, I commend attention to trying to figure out what a model memorandum of understanding would look like. Thank you. Thank you, sir. That's um, helpful feedback. And I would welcome an opportunity to see that uh, MOU. We certainly had those have those with the Howard Center in, in the Burlington area and now across Chittenden County as we expanded away from just the, the street outreach team in downtown Burlington into other Chittenden County communities. I, I would say that this again highlights the difficulty of creating a statewide policy because in certain areas of the state there are not going to be the same resources available. So the MOU, while we could probably give a model of areas for consideration is going to look different in Washington County than it will in Orleans County or somewhere else. This is again, the, the, the trickiness of trying to write something that fits every, everybody's shoe size all across the state. So I, I do appreciate that. I would, I would welcome that, uh, a copy of that document. I could probably get it from Chief Bombardier, it sounds like. And- um, yeah. Tim, Tim has it and so does the, uh, the incoming chief in Montpelier both, because they both signed on. Okay, very well. Thank you for the input. Okay, um, I do see a hand up and I know Martin, you had wanted to um, get to, um, you had some more questions. So we may not have time for both, but um, Tanya, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I work as a social worker and I find myself at times in escalated situations and am not able to use force. I was trained first in de-escalation and so that's my go-to. Given that our police are trained first and foremost in use of force, it makes sense to me that that would be their go-to. I am wondering what it would take to restructure our training program so that first and foremost, our police are trained in de-escalation with use of force as an absolute last resort. We have other countries, Germany, for example, where police are trained extensively, more so than here. They have two years of training and they're only given use of force training at the in the very last two months of their training. And their rates of use of force are drastically lower than ours. So clearly we need to shift the framework. And so I wonder what that would take. I agree with the uh, the last part of uh, of your statement, um, Representative. The uh, the the need to shift the training construct is something that we've been talking about uh, for more than a year now, and something that is on the agenda for the Criminal Justice Council to find alternative paths to certification. This is something Senator White has been um, advocating for, for since long before I was, uh, at public safety, uh, and something we were advocating for, uh, in Burlington previously. Um, so there is a need to change the training paradigm to modernize it for a variety of reasons. However, uh, the first part, I would disagree with the first part of the premise. Um, police in Vermont are not trained to use force first. They're used to, they're trained to engage communities and solve problems at the lowest level first. They're trained to prevent problems from happening. They're trained to engage and de-escalate first and then use force only when necessary. And I go back to my introduction, the state police responded to 125,000 events in, uh, on average over the last three years. 
they use force less than 200 times per year in over a quarter of a million encounters. So I don't agree with the premise of the question. If, if I may, I, I, I completely agree with the uh, emphasis on de-escalation, and it is very rare. The uses of force are 1% or less of our encounters with the public, and I think sometimes in these discussions we lose sight of the fact that 99 plus percent of our encounters with citizenry are uh, resolved without any use of force. Um, we could certainly explore an answer to your question in, in conjunction with the Vermont Police Academy, because they would obviously have to be looking at uh, recruit class hours. Um, there are already, as you know, many state mandates of how many hours they need to have on certain topics of training. So at some point when we add more mandated training, it means more weeks of residential time at the police academy. I don't think you're gonna find anyone in law enforcement leadership who doesn't agree with your emphasis on um, our need to see de-escalation as the primary tool. Um, I think it does happen in most PDs that the people do, just by the nature of the job, we talk to people and the people who talk to people well use less force than the people who don't talk to people well. So we could go way down a rabbit hole of this having implications for recruitment and hiring of, of what types of people we're bringing onto the job. And I'd be happy to have that conversation with you offline. It does have some bleed over into another project I'm working on, uh, on hiring and promotions. Uh, so if you wanna talk offline, I I'd be happy to, to explore that further with you. And if you would like a, a, a estimate of what it would take to shift to that being a, a bigger focus, I can explore that with the police academy. And if, if I could just add one more contextual piece to this, there are over 200 uh, patrol troopers in the state police. We have less than 200 uses of forces in a year that's on average less than one per trooper per year. Now there are some that are gonna have two, three or four because of the nature of their assignment and some that will have none. Um, but to, you know, to say that this is the first go-to is just, I, I don't mean to sound argumentative, I just wanna set the record very clearly straight. This is not the first line of action by anyone in law enforcement in Vermont that I'm aware of. I've heard testimony from the training, I believe it was the training council that there is no mandate for de-escalation training and there is plenty of mandate for use of force training. So there is obviously an emph emphasis on use of force over de-escalation and your own testimony just said that it is impossible to de-escalate certain situations. And I will tell you that my work as a social worker, if our focus first is on de-escalation, that is simply not true. Um, if I may, again, I, I don't want this to turn into an argument, but when you roll up to a, I'm going to pick one of a dozen things that are in my head right now that I've been to, you roll up to a pharmacy where someone is wielding a sword and running at people, um, what would you suggest we do? I'm not saying use of force is never an option. An option. Right. What I'm saying is there are plenty of instances where we have seen people in a mental health crisis die because people weren't properly trained in use of force. We have seen people have yes. their heads bashed in to a to the cement because people weren't trained properly in de-escalation. So I'm not saying that there is never a place. I'm simply saying that there are plenty of places where actually de-escalation would work. And that is the vast majority of the 125,000 incidents that the Vermont State Police respond to on any given year are de-escalated. And a tiny fraction of them result in the use of force. And an even smaller fraction results in an ugly use of force like the ones that you're describing. So the pr again, I cannot disagree strongly enough with the premise that there is a widespread fundamental problem here with the way in which Vermont law enforcement is trained and operates. There is enormous area for improvement, but it is incremental improvement to make very good operations even better. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, I'm sure that we will have opportunity to, uh, to continue this discussion. I have one more hand up and then we only have about four minutes left here before uh, this joint hearing is done. So Bob Hooper, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, good to see you again, Jen. Uh, your answer to Representative Vahosky's very excellent question was pretty much what I was going to follow up on. Uh, but the offline conversation, I think that we really need to dig a little deeper into the people that we hire 
the incidents on Church Street uh, that resulted in the lawsuits and yada, 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 clearly were uh, not appropriately done. So we seem to have people on forces that maybe shouldn't be there. I'd like to have more conversation about the screening tools we use and the appropriateness of them and how people are deemed uh, eligible to police our citizens. Thanks. Great, thank you. We just have uh, three more minutes. Um, you no, know, if uh, Commissioner or uh, Chief Morrison, if you'd like to. One of the questions that somebody asked in committee last week was, and it might have been uh, Representative Lalonde, the inclusion of bystanders in the definition of totality of the circumstances and how that might impact it. Um, so as you can imagine, there are times when a, by, a bystander's behavior might cause an officer to have to uh, escalate their use of force more quickly. And an example, which I could give you dozens of, uh, you are downtown Burlington or Barrie or Rutland, you pick it, and it is bar closing time, and you are trying to take someone into custody for an assault that just happened. And as the bar bars are, are closing and hundreds of uh, inebriated people are forming a group around the officer, uh, bystander behavior necessitates that for everyone's safety, including the person being taken into custody, that we very quickly get the person in handcuffs in the car and drive away from what is turning into a mob mentality. There are also times where bystander behavior would uh, dictate that the officer use a different level of force. For instance, if it was a situation, as I just described, where lethal force was justified, yet there is a spill out of people and a crowd of people as the backdrop, it takes uh, use of a firearm off the table for use of force. So it is a very real uh, truth that when bystanders are impacting the thought choice, the decision-making process, that it can change uh, what type of force or how quickly you move to force or how slowly you move to using force. Uh, so it's not a, a, a one-way ticket to escalate force. It can be absolutely the opposite, uh, that you, a use of force is appropriate, but you can't, you can't take action because bystanders are in the way. So um, I hope that clarifies um, our position on the, the inclusion of bystanders in the definition of totality of the circumstances. And I know you also wanted to hear about the inclusion of the wording without the benefit of hindsight. And to keep it at its most brief, I will say that uh, this statute that uh, S-119 was uh, used California state law and the Seattle PD's policy uh, as a large piece, uh, also some other uh, New Jersey policies, Burlington's others. Um, that, that language is used in those policies as well in, in the California state law. And it is also a specific component of uh, the, the existing Supreme Court law that uh, use of force is judged by. And it again, similar to what we talked about the language in section B5, it is a recognition that it is unacceptable to try and evaluate a use of force from the safety and security of your office uh, on Monday morning and not having to evaluate it from the circumstances of Saturday morning at 2 a.m. in the snow and rain uh, with all the circumstances that are happening, that you have to evaluate the use of force from the perspective of the moment it happened in that context, not from a sterile look back uh, days later or weeks later. It and if I may uh, add one more thing as well, Madam Chair, uh, th this is in part uh, to what Jen was just describing and in part uh, relative to the um, somewhat uppity exchange that the representative and I just had. Uh, and I don't offer this as rebuttal to the prior exchange, but as additional context uh, that is on point with that. Uh, it is not uncommon for the rare instances where force is used by law enforcement, particularly in Chittenden County. I think this is less so with the state police, given the nature of their operations. For those events to actually occur at or around facilities where social workers, clinicians, or other uh, interventionists are doing their work and are unable to control someone by de-escalation, uh, and law enforcement is called because that person is out of control. So there's a, a substantial cross-section 
of the use of force that happens in Vermont that occurs when those other systems that were previously described are unable to control someone's behavior. And I just offer that because it, it, is, it, it strikes me as, uh, I, I, uh, I'm actually a little disappointed that I have failed to bring that up before because it is such an important intersection with this conversation. Um, so I'll stop there. Um, thank you, thank you very much. And um, Ken, I do see your hand up, but um, we're going to have to um, adjourn this hearing. However, the conversation will uh, continue in House Judiciary and, and Ken will make sure that you, uh, you can ask your question uh, then. So thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Government Operations for joining us. And uh, House Judiciary will uh, get back together at 10.15. Thank you. House Government you. Operations, we are on break now until 11 this morning where we will take up H122. So.